Today we're going to look at the autonomic nervous system. So general properties of the autonomic nervous system, it's sometimes referred to as the visceral motor system because it's going to control the glands, the cardiac, and the smooth muscle. It's going to regulate your unconscious processes to maintain homeostasis. This would be things like blood pressure, body temperature, your respiratory airflow. It is involved with visceral reflexes. It's going to carry out its actions without our intent. It happens automatically. This is a good thing. You can go to sleep and it's still going to happen. Biofeedback techniques are means of training that teach some people to control some of these things. It's been useful in controlling hypertension, stress, and migraine headaches. So the components of the autonomic nervous system, we've got our autonomic sensory neurons, our interoceptors, integration centers in the CNS, and the autonomic motor neurons that are going to go to the effectors. So we have a visceral reflex that will go to controlling high blood pressure. So you have the vagus nerve that is going to go to terminal ganglion, and that will decrease heart rate. You have baroreceptors that are going to sense increase in blood pressure and send feedback back up to the brain through the glossopharyngeal nerve. So high blood pressure is detected by the arterial stretch receptors. The signal is going to be sent to the CNS. The efferent travel signal will travel to the heart and slow things down to reduce blood pressure. So there's a separate reflex arc if the blood pressure is too low. So this is going to allow you to see some comparisons between somatic and autonomic nervous systems. So here with the autonomics, you can see we've got these ganglion. So if we compare here, this is a comparison for the sensory input for the somatic nervous system. It will include both your somatic senses and special senses. For the autonomics, it's mainly from intro receptors. There are some somatic and special senses. The control for the somatic nervous system is voluntary. For the autonomics, it's involuntary. For the motor neuron pathways, in the somatics, it's going to use one neuron pathway. For the autonomics, it's usually going to use two neurons. For the somatics, the neurotransmitters are all going to release acetylcholine. All the sympathetic and parasympathetic preganglionic neurons are going to release acetylcholine. Most sympathetic preganglionic neurons release norepinephrine. Those two most sweat glands release acetylcholine. All parasympathetic ganglions are going to release acetylcholine. So there's some differences with the autonomics. Effectors of the somatic or skeletal muscle. The effectors of the autonomics are smooth cardiac muscle and glands. The response in the somatic nervous system is to contract a muscle. In the autonomic nervous system, it can be contraction or relaxation of smooth muscle, increase or decrease rate and force of contraction of cardiac muscle, and increase or decrease secretion of glands. So there's two divisions, the sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, and parasympathetic, which, rest and, which is rest and digest. Two neurons from the CNS to an effector organ are involved. You have your preganglionic neuron. It's going to be a CNS B fiber, and the cell body's in the CNS. The postganglionic neuron is entirely outside the CNS. The cell body is in the autonomic ganglion, and it terminates on the visceral effector. So the somatic motor division lacks ganglia entirely. So your autonomic ganglion are clusters of cell bodies. They're sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic division is going to have cell bodies in the lateral horns of the gray matter of T1 through 12, and L1 and 2, and sometimes 3. The axonal output is referred to as thoracolumbar flow. The parasympathetic division has cell bodies in cranial nerves, 3, 7, 9, and 10, and then the gray horns of S2 through 4. So the axonal output is referred to as cranial sacral flow. So the visceral effectors are organs that are the target of the autonomic message. The neural effector junction is the place where the autonomic nerve is going to deliver the message to the organ.
So when we look at the pathway from the spinal cord to the sympathetic trunk ganglia, you're going to go from the lateral horns to the intervertebral foramina to the preganglionic axons, to the anterior root of the spinal nerve, the white ramus, the sympathetic trunk ganglion. The white rami are going to be communicators. They're structures containing sympathetic preganglionic axons that will connect with the anterior ramus of the spinal nerve. So this is a nice picture because it shows here where you have all of these sympathetic nerves that are going to come out of this sympathetic trunk, shows it going to the ganglion, and then to all of their effectors. This is showing the parasympathetic, so you'll notice they come from the cranial and sacral region. So the sympathetic trunk or paravertebral or vertebral chain ganglia, these are all going to lie in a vertical row close to both sides of the vertebral column from the base of the skull to the coccyx. So you have superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia, and the postganglionic neurons innervate organs above the diaphragm. The prevertebral or collateral ganglia lie near the anterior to the vertebral column and close to the abdominal arteries. So you have the celiac superior and inferior mesenteric ganglia. Postganglionic neurons are going to innervate below the diaphragm. So in the parasympathetic ganglia, the terminal ganglia are close to the area within the wall of the visceral organ. So you've got the ciliary ganglion, the pteropalatine ganglion, the submandibular ganglion, and the otic ganglion. The axons are longer than those found in the sympathetic division. So preganglionic neurons are going to connect to postganglionic neurons, and they'll do it in the following ways. The preganglionic neuron synapses with the postganglionic neuron in the first ganglion it reaches. The postganglionic neuron ascends or descends to another ganglion along the sympathetic chain before it synapses with the postganglionic neuron. An axon may project through a ganglion and a synapse with the postganglionic neuron in one of the prevertebral ganglion. Preganglionic fibers can synapse on the adrenal medulla. So a single sympathetic preganglionic fiber has many axon collaterals, and it may synapse with 20 or more postganglionic neurons. So we create these diverging circuits. The postganglionic axons typically terminate in several visceral effectors. Therefore, the effects of the sympathetic stimulation are more widespread than with the parasympathetic stimulation. So you can have the information come out when it gets to the ganglion. That provides an opportunity for it to spread and go out through several postganglionic neurons at the same time. So if you're in fight or flight mode, you want several things to react very quickly in your body at that same time. So this is showing here. We've got this prevertebral pre ganglion and it coming out and splitting. So your parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. You have axons of preganglionic neurons that are going to project to the visceral effectors and synapse on four or five postganglionic neurons that will supply a single visceral organ. So we have some autonomic plexuses. These are tangled webs of ganglia and axons. They can be sympathetic or parasympathetic, and they're found close to major arteries. So the cardiac plexus goes to the heart, pulmonary plexus to the pulmonary branches, going to the lungs. The celiac plexus is going to go to the celiac and mesenteric arteries, the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, stomach, spleen, and kidney, as well as adrenal medulla. We have superior and inferior mesenteric plexus. This is going to be large and small intestines. The hypogastric plexus will go to the pelvic viscera. So this would include the urinary bladder and genital organs. And then the renal plexus is going to go to the kidney and ureters. So there's a dual innervation from both the sympathetic and parasympathetics. So they're going to operate in a dual antagonism where one system is going to oppose the other. You're not going to be in rest and digest in sympathetic mode at the same time. You're either fight or flight or rest and digest.
So this is showing all of these different autonomic plexuses. So the pathways from the sympathetic trunk ganglia to the visceral effectors, they can go in four possible ways. Spinal nerves, cephalic periarterial nerves, sympathetic nerves, and splanchnic nerves. And we're going to pause for just a minute. All right, I apologize for the interruption. The dog appears happy again. So looking at the spinal nerves, the gray ramus will have axons of some postganglionic neurons that will leave the sympathetic trunk. They'll do this by entering a short pathway called the gray ramus, and then they merge with the anterior ramus of a spinal nerve. So the gray rami communicantes are structures that are going to contain sympathetic postganglionic axons. These are going to connect with the ganglia of the sympathetic trunk to the spinal nerves. So these will serve skin in the neck, the trunk, the limbs, the sweat glands, and the erector pili. So this is showing these postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic division. So our cephalic periarterial nerves, these are going to enter the sympathetic trunk and ascend to the superior cervical ganglion where they can synapse with the postganglionic neurons. Some of these leave the sympathetic trunk, forming the cephalic periarterial nerves. They'll serve visceral effectors of the skin for the face and head. Some of the axons of the postganglionic neurons are going to leave the trunk and form sympathetic nerves that will innervate the heart and lungs. So some of them will pass without synapsing through the sympathetic trunk. The greater splanchnic nerves and celiac ganglia will go into the adrenal medulla. It almost acts like a modified sympathetic ganglia. This is going to release hormones into the blood, 80% epinephrine, 20% norepinephrine with some dopamine. The adrenal medulla is a major organ of the sympathetic nervous system. It's going to be the largest sympathetic ganglia. It secretes large amounts of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it's stimulated by pre ganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers. So some of these sympathetic ganglia will pass through the sympathetic trunk without terminating in it. Beyond the trunk, they form the nerves, what we call the splanchnic nerves, that will extend to the prevertebral ganglia. So between T5 and T9 or 10, you have the greater splanchnic nerve. This will go to the stomach, spleen, liver, kidneys, and small intestine. T10 and 11, the lesser splanchnic nerve, it's going to go to the blood vessels of the small intestine and proximal colon. And then L1 through 4, the lumbar splanchnic nerve, this will terminate in the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So your cranial parasympathetic outflow, it has four paraganglia that are going to be associated with the vagus nerve. The ciliary ganglia, it's going to go to the muscle fibers in the eyeball. The pteropalatine palatine ganglia, this is going to go to membranes and glands of the head. Submandibular ganglia goes to the sublingual salivary glands. And the otic ganglia goes to the parotid salivary glands. So the vagus nerve is going to carry nearly 80% of the total cranial sacral outflow. So looking at the sacral portion, it's going to go through S2 through 4. The pelvic splanchnic nerves, they're going to go to smooth muscle and glands in the colon, ureters, urinary bladder, and reproductive organs. So this gives some comparisons between the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. This is actually a really nice summary to take a look at if you want to look at the differences between the two. So your cholinergic and adrenergic neurons in the autonomics are what we're looking at next. So cholinergic neurons are going to release acetylcholine. So this will include all the sympathetic and parasympathetic preganglionic neurons, the sympathetic postganglionic neurons that innervate most of the sweat glands, and all of the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. So the types of cholinergic receptors, we have the nicotinic receptors. 
They're present in the postganglionic neurons for the parasympathetics and sympathetics and motor end plate. The muscarinic are present in the membrane of all effectors. So your smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and the glands. So the cholinergic receptors release, or the cholinergic neurons release acetylcholine. The cholinergic receptors, the nicotinic receptors, are in the postganglionic neurons and motor end plate. Muscarinic are in all effectors in the membrane. So smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So when we look with the sympathetic division, there is innervation to most effector tissues. So here you can see the nicotinic receptors in there. So here you can see you've got nicotinic and the muscarinic receptors. So this would be to most of the sweat glands. And this would be what it looks like for the parasympathetic division. So your adrenergic neurons and receptors, they're going to release norepinephrine. So the receptors, we have alpha and beta receptors on visceral effectors. Alpha 1 and beta 1 are excitatory. Alpha 1 and beta 2 are inhibitory. Beta 3 is on brown adipose tissue and it's involved in thermogenesis. So this is an example here showing the sympathetic division innervation to most of the effector tissues. So your autonomic tone is the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. This is regulated with the hypothalamus. So your sympathetic responses, stress is going to increase the sympathetic system. We call it the fight or flight response. You're going to have increased production of ATP going to dilate the pupils. This is going to allow you to see things coming in the, at the periphery more. Increased heart rate and blood pressure. You want to make sure you've got adequate blood flow to the head and to the skeletal muscle. Dilation of the airways. It's going to bring in more oxygen. That's going to allow you to produce more ATP in the muscles. Constriction of the blood vessels that supply the kidney and gastrointestinal tract. You're going to shut down that digestion stuff. Increased blood supply to the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, liver, and adipose tissue. You'll have an increase in glycogenolysis, an increase in the blood glucose, and an increase in lipolysis. Parasympathetics are rest and digest. Here the body is going to conserve energy and restore the body. You'll increase digestive and urinary functions and decrease body functions that support physical activity. So you have salivation, lacrimation, urination, digestion, defecation. You'll have a decrease in heart rate, decreased diameter of the airways, and decreased diameter of the pupils. Autonomic reflexes are going to control conditions within the body. These are going to help regulate blood pressure, digestion, defecation, and urination. So the reflex arc organizes the response. You're going to have a receptor at the distal end of the sensory neuron. The sensory neuron is going to project to the CNS, where it will reach the integration center. Here, the hypothalamus, the brainstem, and the spinal cord, they're going to decide how to respond. The motor neurons are going to project from the CNS through one or two synapses and reach the effector that will affect the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. So this is just showing your stimulus coming in to the CNS and then going back out to the body. So the receptor is going to be the distal end of the sensory neuron. Sensory neuron is going to reach to the CNS. Your integration center for this is the hypothalamus, brainstem, and spinal cord. Motor neurons are going to go back out through one or two synapses. And the effectors would be the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So the hypothalamus is really important to this system. It's the major control and integrator. It will also receive sensory input from the limbic system. It's connected to both of the autonomic divisions. The posterior and lateral parts control the sympathetics. The anterior and medial parts control the parasympathetics. Mm -hmm.